So welcome everybody to this first installment, this first module of the mini workshop on fungal communities, their dynamics and their interactions with plants and other organisms. And I'll give two talks which are very introductory to this topic. And I'm focusing in the first one on what fungi are and what they do. So when we look at a landscape, we see plants. So plants dominate the landscape and plants are the primary carb sugar producers. And everything else in, on earth more or less depends on plants. Fungi are basically out of sight, but their actions here is rot, decay, fungi at work, I would say, their actions are visible. So here we have fungi breaking down this piece of wood into little bits and pieces by breaking down the cellulose in this truck. And again, when you look in the forest, you have a piece of bark, you don't see anything. We flip this around and wow, there is fungi galore. There's this whole microcosm of different fungi growing on the underside of this piece of bark. Fungi basically are invisible to us because they're made up of really tiny elements, of filaments, most of them. So we call those hyphae. And they're around five microns thick. And just for comparison, a fine root is around a millimeter, half, one and a half millimeter thick. So 300 times as wide. We can see roots, but fungi, fungal parts are just out of sight. But when we look on Earth about the biomass of all these different components and then compare the size of the biomass with each other, of course, not so surprising, plants on land have the largest biomass. But really surprising to me was that second are soil fungi. Though they're made up of these tiny filaments they still have a biomass second in size before bacteria, before vertebrates and invertebrates, like before insects, before humans, before birds, there are soil fungi on earth have the second largest biomass. So what are fungi in the grand scheme of things? So here we have a simplified tree of life with bacteria and archaea at the bottom. And then we get this big branch, the eukaryotes. We have pl uh, plants, we have animals, and then in between, we have the fungi. So it's important to note that fungi and animals share a most much more common, much more recent common ancestor than they do with plants. So they have more in common with each other than either do with plants. And what are the differences between these three main groups? Well, let's look at plants. They have cellulose and glucans in the cell walls. They make their own sugars and they're sitting there, they're sessile. They don't move around. Fungi, here with a gilt mushroom example. They also have glucans in the cell wall, but they also have chitin. And chitin they have in common with insects for instance, they're sitting there. There are some groups of fungi, the earlier the evolved groups that are, still have a motile face, a face that can move around, and they're not able to make their own food. They depend on plants for their sugars. And then we have an animal here. We have this example is a campus squirrel. No cell walls, it has a skeleton. In this case, the skeleton is internal. Insects, for instance, have an external skeleton. Animals move around, and they're also what we call heterotrophic, so they depend on other organisms for their food. Okay, what do fungi look like? We have a picture of some fungi and some fruit bodies of fungi. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have the cellular ones. We see here also this Flagellum, they say chytrids, 
so the flagella mix and move around. So that is what the motile phase. And then all the other ones are terrestrial and they're filamentous. And especially see, you can see that here, they have these long threads. And then some groups have gone back to yeast phase as here, as in Baker's yeast. And then I have to show you, I apologize for that, a big tree of all the fungi, of Nick, all the fungi, but a lot of groups of fungi. And we can see from how they are distributed on that tree. And you have to see this tree as this part is basically on top of the other part, but then it would be really difficult to see anything on it. So we got rid of that. We put it beside it. So at some point here we have the fungi and this tree shows the fungi in relationship to other organisms. Here we have the plants further away. And then up here we have a whole group called metazoa, so animals like humans and other moving animals. And all above here, from here onward, on these two parts, are fungi. As I keep saying, the first fungi to evolve, they are still aquatic. They still have a, a phase where they can move through water. And they are most of them cellular. And then all the rest is filamentous and sitting there, sessile, so not moving around anymore. But again, some groups still have gone back to this one cellular phase, but they don't move around. So what are these, what can we put on this tree? So we have this filamentous this pinellus, which I showed in, the, in this group up here. We have fly agaric up there with the bolete as examples. And then uh, some examples of this whole big tree on the right, we have the yeast, we have truffles and morels. We have some lichens, but note that Though there are lichens here, there are also lichens in other parts of the tree. Oh, sorry about that. And there are earth stones. Okay, now I move myself away. There are little cup fungi, and then there's a cramp ball on top. So we see already, based on this, on the fruiting bodies, a wide variety. But when we look at what these fruit bodies are made up of, it's all very simple. Okay, I am out of this. So all these different fungi are made up of hyphae. And here we can see a hypha growing and even branching. And they grow by exuding enzymes, for instance, cellulase, that then breaks down cellulose in small bits and pieces that can be taken up by this hypha. Or we can say, okay, they need by absorption, they excrete enzymes that break down material. The enzymes break that down and the little bits and pieces are taken up. And exactly as what happens in your stomach and guts, guts in particular, so that they have in common with mammals and other things. So. Again, we have this hypha. Hypha can um, fuse with each other. You can see that here. And then they can form a little network, which we call a mycelium. And remember that this is the main part of the fungus where all the action takes place. This is where it feeds, where it grows, where it, uh, it exudes enzymes, it takes up stuff. That's, and that's out of sight that's in the substrate, in the soil, in the wood, or whatever it's living on. And in many fungi, this will not last that long. This is made up from one spore, but actually in many fungi, you need a second spore, a second mycelium that will mate with each other to form a new individual that can reproduce again. So that is in a tiny nutshell, a really small nutshell, the life cycle of a fungus. And again, when you look at it, from here we have a fruit body take a cut open, we see the spores, we see in the soil what is happening there. That is the part where all the action takes place. So remember, that is the most important part. The reproductive structures is what we see, but the action takes place in the substrate. And again, 
is a little video of the mycelium and you see all the action taking place. So stuff I'm being moved around. It's like a big uh, traffic circuit. And in principle, a mycelium can keep growing. If you have a huge fairy ring, uh, it's near the Oakland Zoo actually, there's these gigantic puffballs. And the, the estimate is that this has been there several hundred years and been growing every year a little bit. And it's like that. And there is, of course, this example of this humongous fungus. Everybody wants to see that. Um, that's in Oregon, in the Malheur Forest, National Forest. There is a, an, an individual of a honey mushroom. So it's not the mushroom, it's the mushroom that is gigantic. It is again, this vegetative part the mycelium covers a really huge area that is three and a half miles across, a lot of football fields and acres. And the estimates, um, depending on what, the, the, what one thinks on how fast it had been growing are something like uh, 1900 to 8,000 years. So in the thousands of years, almost definitely has been there and growing. You can see it on the map even. So here, because this is a fungus that kills trees. So you can see there are dead trees. You can see where it is. So in red here, this D is the area this fungus took, uh, takes over. The yellow ones are smaller individuals. So give an example again of a honey mushroom. And this is money, how many mushrooms move around when they make these shoelaces in between the bark and the wood of the tree. And the funny thing is that there's here even a, a, a viewpoint. So you can go there and look at it. I mean, you could look at the area where this fungus is. I think that's really cool. Anyway, so some species are able to have gigantic individuals. But in most cases, that's not the case. Uh, there's, there's just fierce competition for food or space. Space is food in many. And they're not that big. And you can see that here in this pine needle. So we have here, it's something like row houses. Here are the walls, these black, what we see as black lines, but are walls in between two individuals. And this one has a quite a big area, so it can make three fruit bodies. And these other ones have a small area, they have only food enough for two fruit bodies. So that is what happens. And you can see this fungal warfare also in wood here. So you see these black lines, which are basically walls again, it's three dimensional. So here's one and there's the other. So they fight for the resources. So that brings me immediately from what fungi actually do, how they get their food. And there are a number of main ways they get their sugars, carbohydrates. That is by being a decomposer or a decayer, breaking down dead material. And we call it also saprotrophic. So sapros is dead, trophic is how you feed. So here we have an example in wood. They get their carbohydrates by breaking down dead plant material, as I keep saying. Basically, they're the garbage recyclers, but fungi do not go on strike. You can see them constantly working ahead, though you can't see the individual workers, as I said already. Here we see them as breaking down the cellulose and the lignin is left behind. We can see them on dung, and Tom will talk much more about dung fungi in his uh, module. So here we see them, they're dung, you see all these remnants of grass, so there's still a, a lot of food available for these fungi to digest. And we know all when we leave something too long in the fridge or in a drawer, especially when it's cut open a fruit or a piece of, I think this is a sweet potato, fungi will take advantage and start growing and reproducing. Here we have some other examples of those species that grow on dead wood, so the crambles and the false turkey tails, and the garicus species. So this is a relative of your button mushroom, split gill, and some turkey tails here on the left. 
but not all fungi, even though their fruit bodies may look the same, live like that. These are fly agarics. This is an example of a mutualist. A mutualist live together with other living organisms in a relationship that is beneficial for both, and in most cases, obligate for both. And the example in the fungi I want to present here is that of the ectomycorrhizal fungi. So they get their sugars from living trees in exchange for goods. And they're called ectomycorrhizal because they are growing around the roots. Ecto is outside, myco is uh, fungus, rhizal. Rhizal has to do with root. So they're outside the fungi grow outside the roots of the plants. They go in between the cells, but not inside the cells. So it's ectomycorrhizal. And again, Tom will talk in much more detail about them. But on the, when you look at a landscape like this in Yosemite, you see all these pine trees. These pine trees can only be there because of the fungi. The fungi are there because the plants are there. So both are dependent on each other. And when we look at what kind of plants, what kind of um, plant families are involved, it is the pine family. So it is the oak and beech family, hazelnuts. Oh, ah. So everything like willows, alders, poplars, birches, and eucalypts as well, they all depend on fungi. So how does it work? Well, we have here an example of a plant, a little pine seedling grown in between two plates of plexiglass with a small layer, the thin layer of soil. So there we have the plant and here we have fungus. All this, that is the fungus. And then here, what looks like nodules is where the fungus grows around the roots of the plant and the exchange between plant and fungus takes place. So the fungus brings nitrogen and often water and gets back sugars. Because remember these, hyphae of this fungus are much smaller than the small, the thinnest roots of this little pine tree. And so they can go places the pine tree cannot go. And they can, can break down humus elements to for the nitrogen to bring to the plant. This is a close up of what is exchange places may look like. So this is a milkcap species which grows around roots. So it changes the architecture of the root and it's very smooth. And this is another one that is, looks completely different. So here you see these hyphae going out in the, in the substrate, a more fuzzy looking one. But in both cases, it's about this exchange between fungus and plant. And it's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So we have here a big old pine tree in Point Reyes. And it could be something like 40 or 50 species of exomycorrhizal fungi on these roots. So any forest you go into here with, with oaks or pines, there are many more species of fungi on the roots than there are tree species. And I want to stress again, from if there are no fungi, there will be no tree. If there is no tree, there are no fungi. So any forest that burns down or is chopped down, you've chopped down much more than just the trees. You stop and chop down a whole community. Not only these species, these exomycorrhizal species, but also all the other fungi that are in and on the tree. And on the fungal side, this relationship also has uh, evolved many, many different times. So there are lots of different looking fungi that are in grow living in relationship with trees as ectomycorrhizal com uh, components of the community. 
So some of the uh, coral mushrooms, a hawkswing, a fly agaric, a bolete, and a milk cap as examples, but I could easily have 20 different species here, 20 other different species. And then the last group are, of course, those that are not nice, in, don't live in nice relationship with plants and other organisms. And we call them parasites of pathogens, pathogens, so causing death or disease. They get their food from living organisms. They damage them or kill them, or in damage, like um, prevent them from forming their own offspring in favor of, of the fungal offspring, killing them. You know, but killing your host is nice, but you don't want to kill the goose with the golden egg. So many are detrimental and keep the hosts kind of alive, but not that the host is happy with that. Here an example of really uh, detrimental effect. So we have a silene and it doesn't form pollen, it forms spores of this anther smut, all this lilac stuff. It's fungal spores. It's not a um, not pollen as the plant would like it to be. And then here we have a, a little crest that grows in the Sierra Nevada. It should have nice little purple flowers, but instead this Puccinia, this rust fungus, has changed the architecture of the plant completely for its own purposes, makes these fake flowers, which are basically leaves, modified leaves. They exude a really nice sweet odor. So insects are attracted, but instead of bringing pollen to the other plant, they bring again other, the spores of this fungus. So it's a very ingenious way of getting some plants doing your willing instead of letting it grow as it should grow. Mosses can also be parasitized. You have the little orange discs of this octospora and the fungus grows inside the moss and prevents the moss from forming uh, sporocarps. Fungi on fungi, yes, absolutely. Lots of different examples of that. And this is one of them, this spinellus, this spiny thing on a mycena. Mycena cannot form any spores anymore because the, the parasite has taken over. The yellow blobs, as I always say, the richest butter on this um, full circuit tail, also preventing it from forming offspring. And here, this is really a cool one, I think. So we have this fruiting body here of this cystoderma. This is the host and the lilac one grows through the fruiting bodies. So prevent it from making spores and makes its own fruiting bodies and its own spores. That is something that happens with other ones. So here we have an elephant saddle from above. Here we have its parasite and when we dig that up and cut it open, you can see that here we have the unhappy elephant saddle, it's being completely taken over by the parasite, which happily fruits, but the elephant saddle is left behind and cannot form any offspring. Hypomesis or, or lobster mushroom on a russula, the same kind of story. Here we have the russula happy, nice fruit body. And here we have it completely covered by the parasite. There's no way that the russula can reproduce. You know, everything is taken over by this red crust. And then, of course, I cannot do this without having a cordyceps in it. So we have a caterpillar, which is extremely dead. So this bushy thing with the long bristles was a caterpillar. And this cordyceps is growing out of it and gobble it up completely. So cordyceps happy, caterpillar not so much. And then lastly, there are other ways that fungi get their uh, proteins by not just um, killing and growing through another organism that is exemplified by this 
oyster mushroom that also breaks down wood, but wood is rich in carbon, but not so rich in nitrogen. So they have found a solution for that. And by making little pegs with a poison on it. So here we have the toxin. And it is meant to paralyze nematodes. So nematodes are small little worms. So here we have the happy nematode comes along, touches the droplet, is completely paralyzed. And again, dead hyphae grow into it and take the proteins out of it and break that down. So there are lots of different ways that fungi can grow. And at the end of this introduction, so what are the main parts I want to stress? Basically that fungi are everywhere. They can be microscopically small. Most of them, the time they are out of sight. They can also be microscopically large and their actions can be large. They can go where plant roots cannot go. They get a food by exuding enzymes and absorption of the small molecules produced by the enzymes in the substrate. And basically the diversity is shown in their ways of life and the form of the fruit bodies. And when we talk about a life, the way of life, they can have, they can live from dead material. They can live in beneficial relationship with other organisms, plants, algae, for instance, but it can also be very detrimental to living organisms. They can kill, they can harm, they can prevent forming them from uh, forming offspring. But basically I want to say that fungi are essential to life of earth. And with that, I'm at the end of this first module in this mini workshop on fungal communities, their dynamics, and their interactions with plants and other organisms. And I wonder whether you have any questions for me that I can answer. And I want to say immediately that Tom will go into some points that I have already started on. So like decay fungi, ectomycorrhizal fungi, and dung fungi.